Hello and welcome to the third and final installment of our new series of panel discussions exploring the role of compassion when it comes to new technology. I'm Tegan Taylor, a health and science reporter at the ABC and co-host of the ABC's daily coronavirus podcast, Coronacast. I've had the pleasure of hosting these discussions over the past two weeks, and I am particularly excited about this week's discussion on compassionate artificial intelligence. On behalf of the University of Queensland, the panelists and production team, I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from which we are variously connected today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants and recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. There are claims that it will soon become possible to program machines to respond and behave compassionately. Does this prospect make you feel excited and awed at humans' capacity for innovation and creativity, or unsettled at the spectre of a society where even compassion is outsourced to machines? Over the past 50 years, there's been a blisteringly rapid acceleration in development of new technologies, but has it made for a happier and more equitable world? Our discussion today is going to explore the future of AI through the lens of compassion. For clarity then, a quick definition. When we talk about compassion, we're talking about something distinct from sympathy, which is feeling sorry for someone, or empathy, experiencing the feelings of others within yourself. Within this definition of compassion lie two interconnected aspects. Firstly, a sensitivity to suffering and need. And secondly, a motivation to do something, to alleviate that suffering and need, not just feeling, but doing. Three brilliant minds are joining me today to pick apart the future of compassionate AI. My first guest is Shannon Valor. Shannon is Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute of the University of Edinburgh and Director of the Centre for Technomoral Futures, where her research focuses on the impact of emerging technologies on the moral and intellectual character of human beings. She's author of Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, and editor of the Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Technology. A former visiting researcher and AI ethicist at Google, she won the World Technology Award for Ethics in 2015 and currently chairs the Scottish Government's Data Delivery Group. What a CV. Shannon, you look at technology through a philosophical prism. What role does philosophy play in this space and what do you mean by technomoral? Thanks, Tegan. So one of the really persistent and dangerous myths about technology that I work very hard uh, to unpick is this uh, idea that technology is value neutral uh, and that somehow ethics and morality occupy uh, a different sphere than the sphere that technology operates within. Uh, you see the same sort of split sometimes in the way that people talk about technology and society, as if technology is something outside of society that can affect society, when in fact technology is not only part of society, uh, and integral to the way that we function socially and always has been. But technology is also uh, integral to the way we organize our lives according to values. Every technology is designed with a value driving it, a value in mind, a value that is an expression of what someone thinks is good to do or good to optimize or good to facilitate and make easier. Uh, and good is a value. And when we make decisions that affect other people, good has to include that moral dimension uh, of care and concern for the needs and rights and dignity of others. So when we talk about technology, it's already got values baked in. It's always uh, designed uh, according to certain values and used to facilitate certain values and often has effects uh, that shape values in ways that we didn't expect or intend or anticipate. So when I talk about techno-moral futures or when I talk about techno-moral virtues, what I'm getting at is actually not bringing two alien things together, but actually reuniting two things that have always been intimately connected and we've sort of artificially separated in our minds and really lost the connection. So the way we train people uh, to build and design technology now is done without any uh, attempt to provide the social knowledge and the moral and political knowledge that's required in order to do that responsibly. And likewise, when we, treat, uh, when we train people about ethics and technology, 
uh, or when we train people about morality, uh, we, we don't give them the scientific and mathematical and technical foundational knowledge. They need to understand what this really means in terms of design choices, uh, what can be done versus uh, what uh, uh, you know, as the media conveys might be possible. Uh, so we, we lack uh, some, some technological literacy when we, when we understand what morality requires of us, and we lack moral literacy often when we think about uh, what we can do with technology. So what I'm trying to do is talk about how those things are brought together in something like wisdom, right, which requires a practical understanding of the world, how you build values into it materially and socially. That's so fascinating. And you talk about them as being integral, but obviously at some point those two paths diverge. How did that happen, do you think? Well, I have a theory uh, about that, and it's uh, perhaps uh, not a mainstream one. Um, but one of the interesting things about the, at least the sort of Western intellectual tradition is that when you look back uh, at the ancient Greeks, uh, at, at Plato and Aristotle and the way they talked about craft knowledge or uh, a techne, uh, which is the root that we uh, uh, acquired for the, for the term technology, when they talk about engineering and craft knowledge, uh, they, they diminish its importance. They, they denigrate uh, craft knowledge relative to other kinds of mathematical and philosophical and political knowledge. And so that split is actually quite early in the Western intellectual tradition. Uh, and there's a really interesting passage in Aristotle where he talks about uh, the uh, prospect of introducing non-Greeks uh, uh, into uh, the political community and giving them citizenship. And uh, Aristotle sort of notoriously uh, unwilling to extend citizenship or full personhood uh, to many people, uh, uh, non-Greek uh, 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 and women and uh, uh, slaves among them. Uh, but what's really interesting in this passage is he says, if you were going to admit uh, non-Greeks into the state, uh, you would need to make sure uh, that the uh, that the essentially that the artisans and craftsmen aren't among them, uh, that you you don't give uh, citizenship to people whose whose lives are driven by the skill in serving others, and that's really the key. Actually, I think I think the key is that technology arose originally not in laboratories not even on the battlefield, it arose in the home, it arose in the domestic sphere of care and concern. And that's relevant to our conversation today. It, technology was first and foremost, a way that people developed the skills of caring for one another, compassionately and in the family and in the community, meeting each other's needs. That's fundamentally what technology is there to do. It's to meet our needs. And meeting our needs is partly what we do with compassion. Uh, but the Greeks were notoriously, the ancient Greek philosophers were notoriously disinterested in the domestic sphere, saw it already as a sort of feminized um, uh, domain that was not appropriate for uh, men of power and, and leadership uh, to, be, to be focused on or valuing. And I think as a result, technology was seen as too close, uh, even then, to the domestic sphere to be uh, valorized, to be treated. Uh, as something uh, worthy of central concern. And I think that prejudice uh, continued all the way to the, to the present. And even when we began to valorize engineers and, uh, uh, and technology uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was only when the story of technology was retold to be a story not about meeting needs of others, but about gaining control and domination over nature. Uh, and over uh, other forces in the material world and over other people. And I think that, that's quite significant. What, a, what an excellent setup for this discussion. It's going to be such a good one to dive into. Thanks, Shannon. My next guest is Sarah Kelly. Sarah Kelly is a business leader and company director serving on a range of sports, corporate, government and not-for-profit boards. She has over 30 years experience in the fields of commercial law, strategy and research including a critical analysis of the ethics, governance, and fairness of artificial intelligence. intelligence. In her role as Associate Professor in Marketing and Law in the University of Queensland Business School, she co-leads the university's Trust Ethics and Governance Alliance. Sarah is Deputy Chair of the Brisbane Lions AFL Football Club, and earlier this year, she was awarded an Order of the Medal of Australia for service to tertiary education and sports administration. Sarah, 
Sports and AI do seem like an unlikely pairing. How is AI used in the sports space and is it deployed compassionately? Uh -huh. um, Tegan, thanks for having me on. And, and honestly, Shannon, what if, and as Tegan said, a great opener, I've just been listening and taking notes. It's just fascinating your background and experience in this discussion. Uh, so back to sport, I guess uh, because I practice and research in sport, um, it, that's the thing that got me interested in this whole conversation. And it's such an important conversation. I think that the rise of AI and its um, into full integration into every aspect of society and humanity, in addition to climate change, are our two biggest wicked problems globally. So it's something we do need to discuss. And in sport, it is, it's used throughout sport. It's used now in talent identification, in selection uh, onto teams, in, in, in mapping and identifying and addressing integrity breaches by using aggregate data, for instance, across the betting markets. Uh, it's used for injury prevention. It's used, of course, in high performance and game plans. It's also now used uh, around fan behaviour uh, and keeping us safe in, in large mega events in sport through surveillance and anti-terrorism initiatives. So, uh, you know, I became very interested in this space and I started down the rabbit hole uh, of a bit of research as you do. And what I found was that some of the predictive capacity in these algorithms and the learning and the decision making at times was biased and unfair in result objectively. And that concerned me. And then I think with my legal background as well, I also saw in spaces such as sentencing uh, and uh, judgments and AI platforms increasingly used in the law as well to make really critical decisions, uh, not just commercial decisions, but also ones around sentencing for re-offenders, for instance. And there's been many cases that everyone here would be aware of, um, such as the use of Compass in the US to predict recidivism and you know it, very biased in the historical data that the systems were learning so i think overall you know i, I found it very interesting as a non-expert in computer science and uh, the programming side of things to really understand well where's it from using governance universal principles around accountability transparency consistency and just plain fairness uh, what is actually happening with these systems and are we universally adopting these, these established governance principles and, and fairness principles? And I think going to Shannon's point first up around values being implemented into these and fed into these systems at the programming stage, educating the programs uh, is really critical and it's, it's great to hear. But I also think throughout that uh, AI, very sophisticated deep learning process that now occurs, that we're doing regular independent audits of the system to test them against uh, proxies of fairness, whatever those proxies are. And I, I'm sure we'll discuss that today. I find that interesting. How do you measure fairness? Who decides? Uh, and what are the trade-offs when you do decide on the proxy? Uh, so that, that's probably what I would have to say at this point, Tegan. Um, but in sport, of course, we're seeing some life-changing decisions. We're seeing in the Court of Arbitration of Sport, for instance, appeals around non-selections that are based on AI systems that in some instances could be um, non-defensible, in others could be seen as completely objective and reliable. Um, many of us who watch sport, of course, are frustrated sometimes by the AI referee and the video AI that goes on. So um, we can talk forever about these examples, but I think sport as a context is something everyone can relate to in this space. It is interesting, isn't it? You think about the initial idea of having something like AI is that it is impartial, but somehow these biases are baked in. That's right. And they they can be, I think, particularly, and I think going to Shannon's point, if there isn't that effective education in the first place and that deep understanding by the programmers, the decision makers, training the AI, and then the, um, the audit along the way as the AI learns itself and becomes increasingly independent in its learning process, um, that, you know, that's, that's important. But I think too, I, I was surprised to find that most of the decision-making around AI systems currently still is made by a certain population, most of them um, relatively young, highly educated Caucasian males, 
<laughs> so that's a problem when we know that diversity and appreciation of it is absolutely critical for achieving compassionate outcomes and a compassionate humanity. Uh, you know, so when we say, um, you know, things like taking multiple perspectives and diverse perspectives, we need to feed that into these AI systems and regularly audit them. You know, why aren't we consulting uh, populations affected uh, and reflecting those populations as we're now hopefully seeing increasingly in boards and governance in organisations? The same could apply in AI, absolutely. Uh, the ethical questions, the moral questions there, of, of course, underpin compassionate behaviour. Um, I think not only those multiple perspectives, but understanding the empathy as well, that is part of compassionate behaviour, not the whole point. And I, I know Paul and Shannon are, are better experts than me on that and much of the audience. But I think that is also really interesting to look at how much empathy can you train an AI system it is becoming increasingly sophisticated from what I've seen, for instance, in the crowd control in sport and predicting when crowds are erring on uh, dangerous outlying sort of behaviour and time to uh, turn off serving of alcohol, for instance, or escorting particular groups of fans out of a stadium. Um, the, it's reading in a very sophisticated way, verbal facial cues. Um, nonverbal behaviours. And these are certainly tools that we use for empathy and alleviating suffering. And in other words, compassionate behaviours. Yeah, we're going to dig into that in just a second. I can't wait. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Tegan. And my third and final guest today is Paul Gilbert. Paul is the founder and president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation, a charity promoting well-being through the scientific understanding and application of compassion. He is Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Derby and Director of the University's Centre for Compassion Research and Training. He has published 21 books, the latest being Living Like Crazy, which explores how, faced with increasingly destructive ways of life, the cultivation of compassion can enable us to refocus on connection, well-being and social good. In 2011, Paul was awarded an OBE for his continued contribution in mental health care. Wow, Paul. Uh, well, you've spent much of your working life as a clinical psychologist in the British national health system. When, if ever, is a compassionate machine a useful tool in a public health setting? My position is going to be that um, AI can be caring, but it can't be compassionate. How? How would I say that? Because compassion is a very specific kind of understanding that requires a certain awareness of consciousness. For example, you may care for your garden, um, you might like growing tomatoes, you may care for your tomatoes and feed them, but if they get damaged, you wouldn't have compassion for them because you know they don't have a mind that suffers. So when things we care about that don't have minds, we talk about we care about them, we can be upset about them, but we wouldn't have compassion for them. Compassion requires us to have an understanding about a sentient mind that's in a state of suffering. So my position would be that we can certainly build machines that can be caring, but the minds that build those machines are the minds that will have compassion because we have minds that have a consciousness. We have minds that understand that it is when we experience pain in consciousness that calls for compassion. And we understand that part of what compassion is, is to address the nature of suffering. So if um, our AI um, machines can't really understand the nature of conscious suffering, then it can be caring, but it can't be um, compassionate. And so that would be my position and uh, be interesting to see how my colleagues think about that position. And this is very important in therapy, for example, because in therapy, we engage in one mind with another mind. And part of the experience of being in therapy is that the person that you are with, your therapist, has some kind of empathic experience or intuition about the nature of your suffering. We know that there are programs like ELISA, which was developed in the 1960s that can appear to be compassionate. This was a program that was based upon a, a Rogerian kind of psychotherapy. So it simply repeated back to the person what they said. So a person would say, oh, I've had a terrible day today. 
and the the program would say you've had a terrible day today oh yes it's been awful you know i was hoping to get to work and there was this terrible traffic jam there was a terrible traffic jam and it's interesting because joseph weizenbaum who developed the program was very surprised at the fact that sometimes people couldn't tell the difference between whether they were talking to a real human or a program so i think all oh, that's very fascinating but in reality, my position is that compassion requires a conscious sentient being to be able to understand the nature of suffering. And without that, we can have caring, for sure we can, and but not genuine compassion. So Paul, I actually wanted to ask you to start us off today uh, for a definition of compassionate AI, but it sounds like you don't think it can exist at all. No, I think caring, I think, uh, I mean, Shan has written a brilliant paper actually on what she's called care bots. So caring behavior, uh, absolutely. And the same with empathy. Look, you know, we can have machines that can identify facial expression, voice tones, all that stuff, but they aren't going to be consciously aware of what they're doing. We can have machines that can understand the functioning of other machines that can monitor what's going on inside other machines and so on. So we can write programs that can analyze data and data can be anything. It can be your voice tone, facial expression or whatever. But again, I wouldn't call that empathy. Um, I would call that simply the ability to understand process. So that would be my position. My position would be that without a conscious awareness of the nature of suffering, um, compassion is, is, that wouldn't be the right word. Caring, maybe, but not compassion. You know, you, you and I know that we, we are biological beings, we come into existence, we will grow old and we will die. We are beings that are very interested in the nature of our survival. What happens to our consciousness? Consciousness is a big issue. Uh, for us as human beings, will we continue to survive after death or not? Or will we see our loved ones after death or not? These are all fundamental questions of being a human being. But whether or not um, uh, AI would have that degree of concern, I'm not sure. The other issue is, I think, motivation. You know, if I remember your birthday, you know that I'm motivated to have an interest in you and you can read into me motivation. But if your care bot um, remembers your birthday and brings you a lovely present and so forth, would you still have the same experience as if it was a friend that did it for you? I'd still get a uh, present. Because you still get a present, which is very nice and, uh, and so on. But the recognition about what is it to intuit a motivation in another mind. So that's another kind of key, key issue, perhaps. Shannon, I'd love to get your thoughts on this then. Whatever we call it, is there still value in having AI that is caring? So that's a really good question. And actually, um, I think we need to make a distinction between caring behavior uh, that uh, where we define that as responsiveness uh, to uh, someone's needs, um, the ability to sort of take care of someone or something. Um, I think we need to distinguish between that and care as a psychological and moral state. So there is a kind of uh, uh, caring that is like compassion in that, as Paul described, it requires recognition uh, of another uh, sentient uh, being. And so uh, there are definitions of care that are, I think, more closely associated uh, with compassion and with the ability to have concern for another. And I think we, we need to recognize that the systems we're talking about today and for the foreseeable future are fundamentally mindless. And it's confusing that we use the word artificial intelligence because it makes it seem as if what we have is an artificial uh, reconstruction of a human mind and nothing could be further from the truth. What these systems really are, are mathematical pattern matchers pattern sniffers, pattern amplifiers, pattern finders, pattern uh, 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 analyzers. That's what these systems do. They are mathematical software packages trained on data that is represented uh, uh, um, in mathematical binary form. And they learn in that data uh, to find certain patterns that are salient and then match that up with what's going on in the world, what's coming on in through sensors, for example. But it's nothing that is experienced. It's nothing that is perceived in the sense that we as conscious beings perceive the world. So 
how can you care for someone if the concept of need or pain or loss is inaccessible to you? What these systems have instead of those concepts uh, is uh, something that Sarah mentioned, which are proxies, mathematical proxies for the things we care about. So uh, in, the, in the machine learning fairness context, we, we don't actually program these systems to be fair because they have no capacity to understand fairness as a concept. What we do is find a mathematical description that for us seems fair. And then we ask the machine to optimize for that mathematical description. And the same is true when we program machines to have compassionate or caring behavior. We're not actually building compassion or even I think care into the machine. What we're doing is finding a, a, a stand-in or a proxy for that, that we are satisfied with as a, a standard of care. And I think that can actually in certain contexts be very useful. There are circumstances where we want these machines to be able to stand in for us as caregivers. I'll give you an example. If you have a, a nuclear, uh, um, uh, uh, malfunction in a, in a, in a reactor or a plant. Uh, think about Fukushima, right? Uh, and there are people who need to be uh, uh, evacuated from that zone. You would love to have a robot that can go in there and safely pull people out as opposed to exposing uh, uh, another human uh, to that threat. Um, and that would be caring, but it would be us caring through this robot. Um, rather than a robot that actually cares what it's taking out of the building. The robot doesn't care whether it's taking a person or whether it's taking a package, uh, as long as it meets the specifications that are programmed within its code. That's something that you've looked at, Paul, in terms of therapy, therapy bots. What, there, are, there is value in having a machine that can listen to you, right? Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, I think the you know Sharon's point is brilliantly put. Really, uh, exactly. So, I think there are many areas where um, having um, therapy bots uh, could be quite useful. Um, it could be quite useful for people who are extremely lonely, for example, to have bots that they can um, talk to and 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 talk about their difficulties and so forth. And we already have programs that will do that. The question is, I think that, um, but we know that they don't actually have any genuine emotion or feeling or empathy for us. And the other issue is in terms of therapy is that how do we treat them? One of the most important things for us as human beings, particularly growing up as children, is that we learn to have empathy for the minds of others. We learn that we matter in the minds of others. We learn that what we do can cause emotional pain or emotional joy in the minds of others. But if you're interacting with a therapy bot, <laughs> such a thing, um, that two-way process, of course, doesn't exist. You're simply in the position of receiving certain kinds of inputs from your therapy bot, but the interactional process is quite different from a real re human relationship. I'm, I'm not saying that it's, it's not useful because I think, as Sharon says, there are various contexts in which it can be extremely useful, but it wouldn't be a compassionate relationship in that context. Sarah, you said something in your intro that um, was vibing with what Shannon was saying before in terms of the inputs are biased. And then you've got this machine that's basically, you know, using the inputs it's been given to make decisions. But then you were talking about then having to apply fairness tests on top of that, but that's being done by humans. Like, how do you ever extract bias out of this equation? Yeah, look, it's it's a good question, and I guess it's one that is steadily being resolved, uh, both from a practice point of view and a policy point of view, governance point of view, training point of view, as as Shannon said, around ethics and values. I think the, as I mentioned, the idea of having in regular independent auditing of these systems as they evolve from the um, initial learning, I suppose, from historic data or the data training sets they initially are given right through to, to keep checking and cross-checking throughout the process, right through to the actual predictive capacities and decision-making that comes out the other end. Uh, and we are seeing some good examples where it is evolving really in a, a very sophisticated way. And, and Paul, I do align with your views overall, but I must say, um, you know, I, I question whether it's actually the combination 
of the synergistic compassionate powers that we can see in AI and humanity that could be the most powerful in terms of compassion of all when they actually work together. So, um, you know, without trivializing things, going back to the sporting context, you know, look, there's a lot of coaches out there worried about jobs right now in professional sport or sport in general, because they're asking, are these AI referees, are these AI coaches going to take over? Um, the talent ID apps, for instance, we're seeing everywhere, you know, it, are, are the nuance, is the empathy, the humanity required from extensive experience in coaching elite athletes, is it needed anymore? Because the AI has access to that tremendous velocity and volume of data that is within reach now. And that's in every context. That's just not sport. It's in health, obviously, as well. Look how, how much AI has helped with COVID and tracing of clusters there. So I think that's a really important point to make, that in fact, the capacity of AI to synthesize and sort in real time at such a velocity that exceeds any human ability can be used and leveraged extraordinarily well by humanity to then apply it in the fairest way, the most uh, empathetic ways, the most nuanced ways, the most creative ways that only humans can do. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting point. In, in my view, when it's done well, the combination of them can be very powerful. I do know, you know, in the courts, for instance, um, I visited in India recently, and of course, um, the caseload in, in jurisdictions like the high courts in India is out of control, particularly in the criminal jurisdictions. There's, there's people, you know, serious crim potential criminal offenders waiting for their trials outside the court days on end. It's that bad. But the high court chief justice said to us, AI is the key to justice and fairness and compassion in the criminal system in India. And they're already implementing very sophisticated programs that can very quickly sort through um, the plethora of volume of data and, all, and evidence and all the rest. And we're also seeing really um, home systems like Google Home now being used for the first time in some jurisdictions as witnesses in cases like domestic violence uh, so I find that really fascinating, um, espionage, uh, things like that, because it is a reliable witness. Um, there's ethical yeah. stuff around. I'd love to get Shannon's insights on that. There's, there's real ethical. Yeah. Human witnesses know. are not reliable. They take a lot of cross-examination to get to the bottom of But an AI witness, what it sees is exactly, and hears is exactly it. So I think that's a, a really interesting space as far as the law and fairness and justice and compassion as part of that, which must be part of the law um, goes. Shannon, you're the ethicist in the room. Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, we have to recognize that there's a difference between having an AI system uh, that helps amplify our intelligence uh, and having uh, an AI system that we are using uh, as a cheaper substitute. Uh, or a more efficient substitute for our own um, knowledge and uh, skill and judgment. And I think particularly in domains like justice, uh, there's an argument that every person as a matter of human rights and dignity deserves uh, to be judged, um, particularly in the criminal domain, um, by another uh, human or humans, uh, as opposed to being judged uh, by a machine that can have no consideration of your dignity or your rights. But that doesn't mean that these tools don't have any place at all in the administration of justice. It's a matter of how you design these tools and whether you think of them as tools versus thinking of them as, again, sort of cheaper and, uh, um, uh, and uh, more efficient and compliant substitutes for humans. So I think one of the things we can think about is if we reimagine AI as a kind of human prosthetic, right? Uh, something that we can use uh, to amplify our own biological capacities. Uh, I think that's a very useful and fruitful line of inquiry. But we have to recognize uh, as we've been talking about uh, what actually AI adds to the equation for us. It's what Sarah was talking about, that ability to sort of calculate and synthesize massive amounts of data very, very quickly uh, in ways that our brains uh, are, are in certain ways limited. 
that is the narrow lane that AI uh, owns, right? That sort of number crunching lane and that pattern matching. Uh, but we have the ability to make sense of it. And these systems don't. These systems are very poor at understanding context. They're, they operate, very, they're very brittle, which means you can train them to be very, very effective and efficient in a very narrow and well-defined task. But as soon as you change the task even a little, or you change the environment in which the task must be done, these systems often break. They stop working. Uh, and in fact, you have to, as Sarah's mentioning, uh, you have to keep auditing these systems over time, because even if you audit them on the first day of deployment and the system seems to be working safely, uh, you get these problems uh, called data drift uh, and, and, and related issues that happen when the environment or the inputs to the system are changing over time. And the system can become out of alignment with the task uh, and performance can degrade very, very quickly. So you have to be able to think about the limitations of these systems as well as their strengths. Mm. So I'm very nervous about the way that our current political and economic order is always looking for routes to efficiency and to sort of cheaper ways of doing things that aren't necessarily better. And in the justice system, uh, I think there's a real danger of these systems uh, being used in ways that undermine uh, the capacity of humans to deliver justice to one another. Uh, there are cases where um, algorithms of a much simpler sort are used to uh, identify uh, uh, which uh, uh, defendants uh, are a high risk, for example, uh, for reoffending. Uh, there's a notorious example of the compass algorithm uh, that was uh, that was developed for for this purpose. And judges who use these kinds of tools often are not given any understanding of the limitations of the tool. And they're often inclined as a result of the pressures and the overloading of the system on them and their workload. They're often inclined to just defer to the system's judgment uh, without a sort of critical reflection. And I think that's quite dangerous. So we have to find the right balance where these systems are amplifying our ability to fulfill our responsibilities to one another, ethically, politically, but that aren't taking away from our capacity to do that well. Whose job is it to regulate this then? Because it looks like self-regulation isn't enough. Uh, and in a last week's discussion, we were talking about trolling and online abuse. And there was a lot of discussion about social media sites and legislation and that sort of thing. Is it one of those things that's just accelerating so quickly that we haven't kind of caught up to it in terms of regulation? No question. Uh, I mean, I think it's it's coming to be. Uh, I mean, I think this is this is one area about which I'm optimistic. There's coming to be a recognition that the status quo is is unacceptable, and that regulation uh, is is going to be required for these systems to be uh, deployed responsibly. But I think it's actually a very delicate moment that we're in, because actually the moment before you regulate is the moment where you have the the option of doing things right. The the danger is if half measures, if, if weak regulation, if regulation comes, but it's not actually strong enough uh, to protect people's rights, then that's actually the most dangerous point because then people think, oh, we, we made the law, we made the regulation, we're, we're done, it's, take, it's sorted, right? Um, and so it's really important at, the, at this time when regulation looks to be on the horizon that we make sure that that regulation is robust, but also adaptive because these things change so quickly and laws are often very slow to change. So we need also to build a regulatory system that's a little more adaptable and flexible than the kinds of uh, regulations that we might be used to of technologies that don't evolve as quickly. Sarah? Oh, yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think at the moment we're at a pivotal time in humanity and we will look back at this time, absolutely, and the sorts of decision-making we're making around AI and its governance and regulation. I do think at the moment we have no real transparency, no real accountability, and no real fairness, objective fairness, that humanity <laughs> judges, not, not a particular subsection of the population. So that's a real problem in terms of uh, regulatory outcomes and uh, compassionate outcomes in this really critical system. So yeah, look, I, I would totally align with that. I actually did have a, a question directed towards Paul. Is that okay? Yeah, please. We love it. 
it's it's a fascinating area, Paul, that you you've looked at around the um, care bots and the um, therapy bots and AI. Um, and I find it a really interesting, I suppose, ethical question that that is in, includes compassion. What if in you know one of our issues in society is an aging population in many issues, increasing urbanization, which means we have loneliness and a lot of elderly people and aged care. So this is where some of these therapy and aid and chat and care bots are coming in. What if so is there an ethical question when the person receiving the care finds that there's on the surface compassionate outcomes? their suffering is alleviated by the bot. But is it ethical, is it questionable is what I'm trying to say, if that person is not aware that it is a bot? Would you um, have an I answer to that? Because I, I find that's... that a really interesting question that I don't have an answer to. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I think that's a question better fielded to Sharon, actually. I mean, I think those are really quite important ethical questions. And the other question I think that Sharon raises in her Shannon raises in her paper is the fact that, that, that well, what happens then? Do we just sort of allow all our elderly people to exist in homes with care bots then? I mean, do we give up the being bothered with them? I mean, you know, it's much cheaper to stick them all in homes with care bots, isn't it, really? Um, so I think there are huge ethical questions around this. I mean, there's, you know, it's quite um, possible that people will actually get a lot of comfort from having a care bot. Could be actually a, a dog. Not, it doesn't have to look like a human. It can be all kinds of things. But the ethics on the provider as well as the receiver are really quite complex. Uh, I'm not an eth uh, ethicist. And the other thing I would like to say is that, from our point of view, I am entirely agreeing with uh, Shannon that um, we are the creators of the uh, um, artificial intelligence who are going to act out our motivations, our wishes, our wants, right? So like developing a um, robot that will go and rescue somebody from a radioactive area, very, very important. My question is, what is happening to our compassion? Because one of the problems we have at the moment, particularly in neoliberal societies, is competitiveness is making our compassion problematic. Um, you know, there's a there's a tradition called Buddhism, which is where people go and spend their lives meditating in order to develop a compassionate mind. We've got huge problems with the fact that humans don't understand what compassion is. Humans don't know how to be compassionate. Now, if humans don't know how to be compassionate, how on earth are we going to be sorting out the questions of developing compassionate AI? We're not. Uh, and I think that goes back to what both um, Sarah and uh, Shannon are saying that actually, if we are the creators, then we need to be clear that we understand ourselves what compassion is and not just go for economic viable solutions. And that for me is a much bigger worry that the creators themselves lack compassion and compassion understanding. Shannon? If I can jump, jump in yeah. and add to that. I, I think what Paul's talking about is so so important because one of the things that people don't uh, think about um, when they think about compassion, uh, they they think about it as something sort of natural and innate, um, uh, and and there's an element of uh, that that's true, um, but fundamentally, uh, and and Paul has used this term, uh, compassion is something that we have to cultivate in ourselves. Uh, it's a skill and a habit that must be exercised in a range of circumstances in order to be strengthened. It's more like a muscle uh, than it is some sort of innate organ that we have uh, that just naturally functions when called upon, right? Um, it's something that has to be exercised over and over again uh, and across a diverse range of contexts in order uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be effective. And uh, this is something that, as Paul mentioned, is, uh, has always been understood uh, in classical uh, 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 traditions uh, of moral practice, uh, whether you're talking about Buddhism, uh, whether you're talking about uh, Christianity, whether you're talking about Confucianism, there's an element, uh, a role for compassion in almost all sort of social value systems culturally. Um, and it has to be exercised in certain rituals or practices or ways of, of living. And the problem that, that I think Paul and I uh, are, are, are equally worried about is that we have a, a social and economic order today that uh, does not seem to make space for compassionate practices. 
um, in our workplaces, for example, um, efficiency is the rule. Uh, and uh, because compassion can slow down certain operations um, or change the, the pace or the rhythm or introduce friction, um, uh, it's, it's discouraged, right? Um, it's not rewarded. Uh, it's something that people are having trained out of them, not trained into them. Uh, and then we expect people to go home and be compassionate to their families uh, after they've been rewarded all day in an environment for shutting that part of themselves off. And we absolutely have to change that. The reason our planet is in the condition and the peril that it's in is precisely because we've lost some of these moral capacities in our culture. And that's not technology's fault. That's our fault. And that's the fault of our uh, self-awareness and, and, and motivation uh, uh, to, to live well, but technologies can, uh, can make it worse. Um, I'm very interested though in the possibility of using technologies to make that better. Um, so one question I would have for Paul or Sarah uh, is what, how might we use technologies mm -hmm. to boost our, our capacity to train ourselves to be compassionate? Is there a way these technologies uh, can can be, if you will, a prosthetic for that sort of weakened compassion muscle uh, that that we're suffering from. Paul, Sarah, who wants to jump in first? Paul, go. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. So um, certainly we can have um, technologies that will allow us to monitor what's going on in our minds. So, you know, look at our uh, vagus nerve or whatever it is and give us feedback as to when perhaps we are um, using emotions that are perhaps very destructive. And indeed that is being used now in terms of psychotherapy, giving people biofeedback and all of that. The, the question that you're raising though, I think, or the, the proposition that you're putting is fundamental, which is that you know we are existing in areas where the drive for efficiency to do things quicker and cheaper um, is actually driving out compassion because compassion is time costly, right? So we can have an efficient world, but it might be a very cold uh, world indeed. So efficiency doesn't necessarily increase um, human happiness. It increases economic wealth and not happiness. And I think one of the key issues for us is deciding on what kind of world we want to live in. Do we want to live in a world that's super efficient, but is actually quite cold and we're all turned into um, a sort of robot servers? Or do we want to live in a world that actually does take human values, human needs, human desires, human hopes, human wishes as part of the world we want to create? Now, unfortunately, uh, most of our economic systems do not, are not designed to function to address human needs. They're designed to address the market, right? And the free market for all of its uh, wisdoms or stupidities is not a place which is there to promote human needs. I mean, you, Sharon, mentioned the issue of vaccines, sharing the vaccines, or I think with Sharon, sharing the vaccines around the world. That's an example where we have lost our compassion. So, you know, people like me are being offered uh, third boosters, but actually there are people in other parts of the world who haven't vaccines at all. So we haven't worked out how as a species, as humanity, to have compassion, to bring compassion into the world and to address the key issues of what it is to be a human being that comes into the world, has wants, needs, uh, and uh, knows that it will survive for a while and then it will die. How, how do we build a world that is actually fit for humans? Not just <laughs> having lots of machines that would do lots of practical things, but actually everybody in the end ends up, as you say, with our compassion training gets trained out of us. Sarah, you're in the commercial space, probably the most out of this group. How does this work in real life? Oh, yeah, look, I think some really interesting points have been made. My um, very exciting conversation. I, I do think um, I, I have a lot of optimism around technology and its power in a good way, in a positive way. And I'm seeing it in, well, in the context like sport, the law, uh, business as well, around training people to be compassionate, uh, whether we're talking about front of line sales and service people who are prone to burnout, for instance, or what we're seeing, I know, in hospitality at the moment in some uh, countries in the world, I won't name them, but um, service sabotage happening because uh, there's a, a fear of foreignness creeping into society. Uh, so when they're serving foreign tourists, for instance, some 
there's this service sabotage going on, all sorts of things. So we're using, increasingly you're seeing the use of augmented reality and virtual reality AI being used to uh, train and retrain people around compassionate service behaviours. I find optimism in that. In sport, we're seeing it around uh, things like um, team leadership, team interactive, cohesion, connectivity behaviours that are so important for high performance in a sporting team that can also be translated to the workplace and business for, for high performing teams and bringing back the collaboration, going back to Shannon's point around the hyper competitive, hyper connected, um, you know, high velocity society we live in, you're know, bringing that back to let's retrain collaborative techniques compassion, appreciation of diversity um, in our teams and in decision-making or in our customers uh, to um, ensure employee or humanity well-being in our businesses. And so I think I have a lot of optimism around that and I'm seeing some fantastic apps and headsets in VR and all the rest in um, implementing that. So I think that's exciting. I think it was you, Paul, that was saying before about this sense of maybe someone's being cared for by a machine, but they might not realise it, that idea of a Turing test where you're not sure if you're talking to a human or a robot. And I just wondered whether that's important, whether it matters if people know if they're talking to a human or an AI. It's a great question. And again, it's that's quite a complicated question. I mean, I mean, as Sarah was saying, I don't think any of what it, any of us uh, disagree with what Sarah was saying in that ca compassionate minds can create technologies to support compassionate motives. It's, that's clear, we can do that, whether it be virtual reality or whatever it is. <clears throat> Absolutely, we can do that. But can those technologies themselves be compassionate? That's, I think that's the issue. And the question that you, you're putting, Tegan, is if we interact with a, 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 an AI system, that appears to behave in so many ways like a human, and we respond to it as if it's another human mind that does have an interest in us, it is motivated to care, um, does that matter? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think probably it does, but I, I, I would uh, turn to the ethic ethicist amongst us to answer that question. <laughs> Well, I will say that um, many people who work in this field, uh, myself included, uh, and by this field, I mean the field of technology ethics, uh, robot ethics, AI ethics, have argued in fact, uh, that is a general principle, uh, a human should always be aware when they're interacting uh, with a, a machine agent, um, in, in part because deception is uh, fundamentally wrong and a violation of people's autonomy um, and, a, and a failure to respect uh, one another. Um, there are some edge cases, however, where it becomes a little less clear. So uh, let me say as a general rule, uh, Tegan, yes, uh, people should uh, always be uh, able to clearly discern uh, that they are speaking to uh, a robot uh, or an artificial uh, uh, bot uh, and not uh, to uh, a human being. Um, and that's particularly important when we have technologies that are designed to activate our social and moral and emotion, emotional responses. Um, a lot of these technologies are now using um, sentiment analysis uh, 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 techniques to discern, as was said earlier, our facial expressions and then mirror those back to us in emotional uh, uh, sort of signaling displays. But that's very dangerous because these technologies, as we've said, don't have any emotional life themselves. And so uh, a machine that is pretending uh, to laugh at your jokes, a machine that is pretending uh, to be flattered uh, by your praise um, is a machine that's designed to deceive you. Now, I think one of the things that we need to think about, however, is that there are kinds of white lies that we accept all the time in society from one another because they relieve social friction in ways that are relatively uh, harmless, right? So we might think, are there certain kinds of robot design, for example, that are sort of technically deceptive, but they're really not doing any harm because we kind of, we all really know what we're, what we're seeing. And maybe as people become more sophisticated about AI, they'll be less likely to be deceived by some of these displays. There are other situations with um, actually therapy bots, uh, this is quite relevant, and care bots, where you might need that kind of emotional signaling in order for the interaction to be therapeutic. 
So there is uh, some some complicated issues. Uh, if if you bring a machine that's like I am a robot, I have no feelings, right? How are you going to get someone to trust it and interact with it in a positive way? So you have to design these things to you know activate our our pro social attitudes and responses. And yet you wanna do that in a way that doesn't leave people vulnerable to being manipulated or exploited, uh, which is fundamentally uh, something that the deception uh, uh, usually exposes us to as a, as a risk. So I would say that as Paul mentions, it's a really delicate area. And that's why it's essential that the people making these decisions are quite sophisticated in their understanding of ethics, because these are not often sort of simple black and white decisions. They often require a really sensitive understanding of human needs, of context, uh, and of uh, and the need to find a, a solution that reflects a diversity of needs and values uh, and interests. It's so interesting how that, so this is the third in a series and if dear, dear audience, you haven't watched the first two, I strongly recommend you go back and do because it's so fantastic to see how these ideas interconnect. And we were talking in the loneliness um, seminar about the, this person is sort of in their approaching 50 and talking about social media sort of hijacking their well-being, but their their child is actually navigating that space quite easily. And I wonder if part of the difficulty here is that we're in this transition period and that the technology is becoming very sophisticated, but we societally haven't sort of caught up with it yet. And that maybe in a generation's time, this is just, just, just how we operate. Paul? Yeah. I, oh, I, Shannon, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we will uh, uh, adapt uh, and ad adjust to these technologies and, and become better at, at living with them. Um, but I, I think that we need to not be complacent and not assume that that adaptation will be for the better. It will be for the better if we choose that, right? I mean, there are there's adaptation that actually improves uh, an ecosystem, and then there's adaptation that's actually a form of, of lost capacity and, and a, a adaptation to a lesser uh, mode of survival, that's just as possible, right? You can get used to a, a, a situation that is uh, not acceptable and we don't want that to happen, right? We don't want adaptation to mean 10 years ago that we've accepted the unacceptable. Um, what we want is adaptation where we've learned to live well with these technologies and that depends very much on the choices that we make today. Sarah, I can see you nodding and taking notes. I'm finding it so interesting. It's a great conversation. Fascinating. I, yeah, look, I um, I was just thinking about, you know, the latest, the sort of trend towards universal regulation and governance for business is trending towards what in Australia we're calling the environmental, social and governance ESG reporting requirements. And this would be something that would capture some of these issues quite well, along with the UN goals um, that most countries are signatories to. So I think there's a lot of hope there around the governance side of this. Um, it is a really, it, yeah, it's an interesting question. I was just thinking also too, I, I did read a book that many of you might have read, um, Clara and the Sun. Did you read that, Shannon? Paul? It's a I wonderful <laughs> book. But I would read it book. Paul. I'll get hold of it for you because honestly, it is, it's a wonderful book um, about uh, the future of AI and genetic editing for that matter around children. And it is just, it makes you think differently around um, the potential for AI to be compassionate. Well, I have no doubt at all that compassionate minds can create AI um, robots or whatever that will act out and do our motives. They do what we want them to do. So if we want to have a more compassionate society be it, as you say, training people in virtual reality. We am actually part of a big research program that does that. Um, yeah, this is all to the good. Look, we, you know, we've got loads of um, machines that are just fantastic. Uh, if you go into any modern operating theater, you would not survive without them. And they're monitoring your blood pressures and so on and so on. So there's no doubt about that, that if we use our compassionate motivation to create uh, robots, to perform actions which have compassionate outcomes, that is terrific. And there's no doubt that that is going to improve and so forth. I think what Sharon and my point, and I think also your concerns is, is that actually we can create AI that will actually 
not fulfill those functions, but will fulfill functions like caring as substitutes so that we don't have to engage with compassionate uh, outcomes. We can kind of fob people off, if you like, with um, um, caring nurses or whatever, uh, where in reality, um, we actually require humans to engage in those kinds of behaviors. Or when we don't, we're clear that actually it might be better to have a robot do that rather than a human. So I think these are really fundamental questions. I mean, in the cases of infectious diseases, for example, um, would it be useful for there to be more uh, robots who are not gonna get infected, <laughs> not gonna die from getting viruses, or do we actually need to put people at risk of working with people who have a severe, dangerous virus? I mean, these are really very, very important questions. They're ethical questions. And uh, so I'm certainly not saying that we can't use our intelligence and our compassion to build um, robots or care bots that are, can be extremely useful in certain contexts. I'm just saying we've got to be slightly careful when we start to substitute them for real human relationships. Uh, I think that's the area where we, we will start to get into difficulty because real human relationships are based upon real human minds that are conscious, that are empathic, that have wishes, that have desires, that have motives, and uh, care bots don't have those. We're almost just, out of time, but I just wanted to really briefly get from each of you what one thing that you could imagine about this, a good future where humans and AI are working in partnership. Shannon? Yeah, one thing that I've been thinking about is that even by the standards of efficiency, we're doing it wrong uh, as things stand. Uh, and that there's so much opportunity uh, to use technologies in a, in a wiser way. So think about, for example, the problems we're having in the supply chain, the problems we're having with the high vacancies in sort of critical uh, frontline uh, 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 workers and serve in the service economy. And think how much of that is because uh, we've created a world where uh, people don't feel uh, compassion at work. Uh, people don't feel respected and treated well by their employers. They feel like machines. What we've been doing uh, is, is not actually making uh, machines that are more like people, but building systems that try to make people more like machines. And what we're seeing now is the knock-on effects of that and the social chaos uh, that that creates in the long term uh, because people are burned out, uh, because people uh, are, are miserable and would rather do anything else than be treated that way. Now, think about what the world would look like right now and how much better all of our sort of systems would be running if we hadn't done that. What if for the past few decades, we'd been investing in technology that made people better cared for at work, um, that facilitated more compassionate uh, relationships uh, between uh, employees and managers uh, and customers? Uh, what if we had been investing in making <clears throat> people happier and healthier in the employment sector? Now, that world is not only a more efficient world, right? It doesn't have the sort of breakdowns that we're seeing in our, in our supply chain and, and uh, employment sector today. Um, it's also one in which people are, are happy and healthy and not uh, breaking down themselves. And so there is a win-win option here, right? Where technologies are used in ways that strengthen human capabilities, that promote human flourishing. And in the long run, that's not only morally better, it also happens to lead to a more functional uh, society, a less wasteful and, and destructive and painful one to live in. Who doesn't want that, right? So I, I think that opportunity is what needs to be seized. Briefly, Sarah? Oh, uh, yeah, look, I'd, I'd probably distill it into maybe three points. And I guess the first one, would be around um, the AI literacy. I think very few people in society, even people um, in decision-making capacities, uh, it, you know, they're not educated around AI literacy. So I think be part of that, um, that table, that debate, this debate, uh, understand it. I think it's almost a, a moral ethical duty to, to be involved in the debate. That's first up. I think secondly, um, start the education around it um, in very early childhood, getting it embedded in our education systems around the world um, so that kids are growing up and it doesn't matter what walk of life they end up in, they have a true deep appreciation of AI, how it works, 
and more importantly, uh, the compassionate and ethical and fairness sides. And I think the final point is um, a lot more independent evidence and research around proxies for fairness um, and ensuring there's diverse decision making around those proxies that become universally agreed and fed into effective governance systems. Paul? Well, I think we're all agreed that we our intelligence are at a point now when we can build intelligences, if we can call them that, or at least um, calculating machines that can process information much faster and more efficiently than our human brain can. And it's really all about how these processes are used, right? So the first thing is, I think we've agreed that, you know, we are the compassionate creators, the machines themselves are not. They will act out what we program them to do. And therefore us understanding what compassion motives are and why we want them and why they're important, as Sharon says, because, you know, well, let's build a world around compassion then in our workplaces, in our schools, in our families, you know, our relationship would be so much better. As a psychotherapist, I can tell you, a lot of people do not understand what compassion is. They're, they're, a lot of people come into therapy thinking that it's all about me, me, me. And uh, by the way, don't forget about me. Now, that's okay to a degree, but I think we need to be helping uh, from the schools upwards, people become much more mindful, much more compassionate orientated, much more ethical, much more aware of uh, international problems, ourselves as a species, the world problems, the problems we've got in some of our political systems. And if we can get that right, if we can help our children begin to conceptualize their experience of being a human being in the world today and where we've come from, because we have to be aware that humans are potentially one of the nastiest, cruelest horrible species if you think about the roman games and you think about the slavery and so on and so on we have to train our minds in order for our minds to then be able to build the ais that we want in order to fulfill compassionate motives and compassionate intentions that's the bit i'm interested in and the actual technologies i think that's brilliant and wonderful but they won't be compassionate we're the ones that have to be compassionate Thank you so much to all of you, Paul Gilbert, Shannon Valor, and Sarah Kelly. Well, that's all from Compassion and the New Technologies. We hope that you found these discussions helpful in thinking about how we harness the best that technology can offer to help us to create a world that's fair, sustainable, and builds on our innate human capacity for compassion. If you haven't had the chance to watch the other two in the series, I strongly recommend you do. They are full of food for thought and reflection. My thanks to all our guests over the past three weeks and to our production team, Alastair Foster, James Kirby and Pascal Berger. I'm Tegan Taylor. Bye for now.